Hi, I'm Tim Clark, and I hope you enjoy the video that you're about to watch. If so, please let me know by clicking the subscribe button. Today we're featuring the famous Coleman Theater in Miami, Oklahoma. And here to tell us all about it is Danny Dillon, the theater's managing director. Danny, let's go way back in time. Tell us about the early history of the Coleman Theater. Okay, well, our story begins back really in the late 1800s. Uh, the uh, gentleman who built the theater eventually, George Coleman, and his brother came to this area, which at that time was before statehood. And so Oklahoma was known as Indian Territory. And uh, they came here, it's where they chose to come and live to become wealthy. They said, this is a new country with lots of opportunity and we're gonna, we're hardworking people and we can work hard and be rich. So they uh, settled on this Northeastern part of Oklahoma and gonna dig water wells. So you and I both know that's probably not what they were expecting to get rich by doing. So I'm assuming oil had been discovered in Oklahoma, something that they thought when they were digging, maybe they would, uh, would strike something that would bring them some money. And one day, uh, about 13 miles northeast of Miami, they were digging a water well for a woman on her um, allotment. And uh, their drill that they had, by the way, borrowed the money to get enough money to have that drill because they were not wealthy guys when they started. Um, their drill wouldn't go down as far as it normally did everywhere else. It hit a lot, something really hard. So they just pulled it up and went over a little bit and tried again and again and again. And they, there was something massive down there. And as they were pulling it up, the, the, what was coming up was exciting to them, though they didn't know what it was. There was some, a lot of mineral there. So they had a dilemma because um, you couldn't own the land. The lady they were digging the, the water well for didn't own the land. Uh, again, that was an allotment. She, she could own her home, but not the land. They didn't have any right to the mineral that was there. So they didn't want anyone else to find it. So they filled those holes all back in and patted them down. They came back over to Miami. They got some investors with them and the four of these men started a company that uh, they, they uh, secured a lot of mineral rights. So that gave them the ability to go back over there. They, they had bought, uh, they had not purchased, but they had gotten the rights to uh, thousands of acres, Northeast Oklahoma, Southwest Missouri, Southwest Kansas, Southeast Kansas. <laughs> and the, the, so they had rights to, to a lot of the minerals and then they started digging and what they had uncovered there turned out to be recognized as probably the largest vein of lead and zinc in the world, if not the largest, the second largest, but it was, it was huge. And at what a time this happened because now we're up into the 1900s now and looming on the horizon on the worldwide front was none other than a world war. Every country in the world needed both lead and zinc. And George Coleman was the man who got to tell them the price of lead and zinc. He made a lot of money. So this guy who had borrowed enough money to have a drill, now suddenly um, conservative estimate of what, we're, what we tell <laughs> was about a million dollars he was making every month. Now, we also can see there were Sometimes he made that in a week. You know, it, it just, there was a lot of money to be made. And he made, he was 52 years old when that happened. And he was a bachelor. So the next step, I guess, is to find a wife. And when you're making that kind of money, 52-year-old bachelors are pretty attractive. And he found a wife almost 30 years younger than he was. And because, you know, he needed to have an heir. And so he got married and uh, the two of them, according to what I've been told, <laughs> loved entertainment. And so um, they, they could, uh, you know, enjoy traveling and get to see the types of entertainment, the opera houses and the vaudeville shows and all of that everywhere along. But they were so interested in entertainment that actually he invested a lot of his money in a brand new industry in the West that we call today Hollywood. 
So uh, he, was, he was such a big investor, and there weren't many of them in those early days. So he sits on the board of directors of MGM Studios. And I always laugh about that until, you know, here he was digging water wells in Indian Territory one day, telling them how to make movies in Hollywood the next. And uh, so with that, he made other good friends and, and you know, built a house out there and, and uh, got to be business partners with some of these folks and, uh, and he had his own personal board of directors that come here to Miami and, and every, every quarter and, and have meetings and such. And, and he decided with Route 66 traveling right down our Main Street. In fact, today, you know, Miami has the longest stretch of Main Street, uh, that is Route 66 uh, for a Main Street. And uh, so, so going right down our Main Street, Route 66, he figures, you know, those traveling vaudeville shows could get to us. There's a way. Uh, and so he asked one of those uh, gentlemen who was on his board of directors, he, he um, said to him, look, you know the entertainment business better than I do, Bing Crosby. He said, how, about, how do you tell me, how do I get vaudeville shows to come to Miami to entertain the people that work for me who, you know, he knew they wouldn't have the opportunity for leisure time and, and money to travel like, like he was able to do. And so, uh, and when I talk about the people who work for him, let's, let's look back now at what happened at that area where he had covered up those, those initial attempts to dig. Uh, a town of 30,000 had sprung up over there and in what is what became Pitcher, Oklahoma. Uh, it, it became a town of 30,000, three banks, th uh, movie uh, theaters and hotels and all sorts of things that today, if you, if you know of Pitcher, you don't think of those things, but, but it, was, it was a booming business and those people all, if they didn't work for him, it was their work because of him, you know? And, and he was just trying to bring entertainment as he helped to establish this young town of Miami, Oklahoma. And so, um, so Bing Crosby told him, look, you have the money, you could get anybody you wanted. And the very best of the traveling vaudeville shows is called the Orpheum. That's who you wanna get. So he went straight to the Orpheum folks and, and invited them to make Miami, Oklahoma one of their stops as, I, as they itinerated throughout the country to come here and entertain. Well, imagine how exciting that was to them to get invited to this little town in Northeastern Oklahoma. They were playing Chicago and St. Louis and uh, all the way out to California. And all, you know, they, they were playing the biggest theaters and they, they just said, look, we have gone through your town and there's nowhere there for us to entertain. And so Mr. Coleman said to them, look, you, bring your ax to Miami and I'll make sure there's a theater there that it would fit up to, you know, what you're used to performing in. And um, so they made the agreement and they signed a contract. Now, he surely read the contract, but if, you, I, if I knew what that contract stated, I don't know who in their right mind would have signed it because he signed on, this was in 1928, he signed on that they could appear in Miami. Their first stop would be April of 1929. He had one year, less than one year, to get this theater erected and open for a show. And they did it in 330 days. Now, imagine that. I, today in Miami, you wouldn't have a, you would not have your permits through in 330 days. So there is absolutely no way that could happen today. But this, we have our theater today because of, of that. That's how it came to get here. So tell us about the grand opening show. Well, the opening show, you just can't, you know, we have, we have the program from that opening night and, and you can't imagine that all that got crammed into one night's performance, but they actually did it two weekends in a row. People came from everywhere. This was a 600, 1600 seat auditorium that was selling out every time. Of course, it was the only air-conditioned building in the, in the county, so I, I guess people were enjoying that. He kept the price, uh, I think it was a dollar for that, but there were movies, there were about nine different acts of all sorts and all kinds, and uh, it was just a really, really big show, and of course, people had never um, seen such an elegant building in, their, in this uh, 
region before. So people were coming from all over and uh, it just, uh, it was incredible. But then the biggest names, like I said, this, this was the best line of, of vaudeville. So Blackstone the Magician was here, the Marx Brothers, uh, Will Rogers of course performed here, Tom Mix rode his horse on our stage and uh, um, even Sally Rand, the infamous band dancer <laughs> that had closed down, they had closed her down at the World's, World's Fair in Chicago, put her in jail uh, because of her act being so risque or whatever. Uh, of course, the people demanded that they let her out and start her show back up because they enjoyed it so much. And uh, But nobody ever knew whether Sally was wearing any clothes underneath those fans and feathers in this conservative little Bible Belt town had Sally Rand here, not once, but twice. So I think that's kind of amazing. Um, uh, Cary Grant was here, you know, in his vaudeville days. It, it's just kind of uh, uh, amazing, the history of performers that have uh, been here. Now let's move forward in time. Tell us about the renovation and why it was needed. Okay. So, in 1945, Mr. Coleman passed away, and uh, you know, by the time he opened the theater, it was really uh, vaudeville was was fading away. Uh, talking movies had come in, where Mr. Coleman had had a, uh, a mighty Wurlitzer pipe organ built for his theater to accompany the silent movies and all that. We were just on the cusp of talking movies in 1929. It, they had started a, a year or two earlier. So really that kind of life was fading away. Uh, it, it, the theater had become more like a movie palace. And when he passed away, his widow and their son moved to Florida and they just hired with another management company that came in that showed movies. And um, through the years, um, well, society just changed where people had loved to come into this elegant theater during the depression when they could scrape up the money and, and come. And it stayed active because he kept the price real and expensive. But, um, but things had changed. And so uh, they tried to change with the times and, and change the decor somewhat and, and make it a more appealing to society of the day. But, uh, and it was a great place uh, through the 50s. Uh, of course, in the late 1950s, uh, the... Um, cable that held up the big beautiful chandelier started to fray. <laughs> it weighs 2,000 pounds, so they decided, you know, we need to remedy this. Well, honestly, it didn't fit into their decor anyway, and instead of replacing the cable, they just took down that beautiful chandelier, then it was gone. Uh, they didn't use the organ much anymore, so as time went by, just to keep some income flowing in, they sold off that Wurlitzer organ that had been built for the Coleman Theater. And uh, they had changed, they, they had uh, repainted over uh, a lot of the gold leafing, they had painted it uh, one solid deep color, they had taken down a lot of the fancy moldings. They, it just, uh, it got really a, a different look and then they didn't keep it up. Uh, they didn't keep a good roof on the place, so it leaked and it had had a lot of water damage. Uh, they had changed out the seats that, to look more like Art Deco seats and those were worn out. They needed replaced. The carpet that they had put in needed replaced. and. Uh, by the mid 80s, they were not making a lot of money. You know, they could only show one movie here. So uh, people had gotten used to the Cineplex idea that they would go somewhere where you had some options. So uh, they, they just weren't doing that well as far as making money. And, and that company decided not to renew their lease. Well, the Coleman history is just that George Coleman, who built the theater, had just his one son and uh, his son had three daughters. And so um, when he, he made it, uh, uh, the son had done so well for himself uh, that honestly had sort of moved out of, of Miami. He not only began Chris Craft Motors uh, boats, the, the boat, he had, he had uh, modified the speedboat engine. He was such, he did so many different things, but uh, he, had, he uh, also helped to found Penn's Oil. Uh, he had three daughters and, and one of them married into the Woolworth family and another one married royalty over in Europe. They had moved out of the little Northeast Oklahoma town. And so this theater was not of their primary uh, importance. And so uh, all of a sudden there was becoming a problem because their management was given up. What were they going to do with it? And, um, and so the Coleman's owned a home here uh, that the grandfather had built. The one granddaughter was the only one who ever came here much and she just decided to sell it. And she donated all the buildings that the Coleman's still owned to the city of Miami. So the city received the, the big theater, all just, all of it 
free, but it was in such a bad state of disrepair. In fact, the balcony had been closed off for several years. They said it was falling in, you couldn't use it. They were afraid of the, the liability of that. Um, Miami had just lost their big union wage job and it looked like their tax base was gonna wipe out, that a lot of the people could move away with the Goodrich plant that left. Uh, they just knew their future was very uncertain and they didn't have the funding to go in and, and uh, save this old theater. And, and, and so uh, they were hoping to keep business downtown and help the downtown retailers. So they thought a good parking lot might be a good idea. And they were actually considering raising the theater and putting in a nice parking facility. That's where our story really begins. I brought you right up to the beginning of our story, which is the renovation of this theater. Because, uh, you know, we're a member of a group called the American, the League of Historic American Theaters, uh, LHAT. And uh, we go and we meet with people from historic theaters all over the country. And uh, a lot of what I have told you up to this point about Mr. Coleman and, and a wealthy guy coming in and helping out is their story up to that point. I have not found another theater whose renovation was done by volunteers and donations like this theater. But that's what had to happen because uh, when they were begging the city to not tear down the building, they said, look, this place might look bad, but our memories are holding up those walls and you can't tear down our memories. And uh, <laughs> what's the city gonna say to that? There are enough of those people that they, they thought we're not gonna be, you know, um, very popular if, if, we, uh, if we tear this down. So they said, here's what we'll do. We'll save the building uh, and uh, we'll let you all do the management. So they, they formed a trust, the Miami Downtown Redevelopment Authority. And they said that trust can oversee the theater and basically its operations and can do whatever it wants to do. They said, we are, it's a city building and it's always gonna remain a city building. And because of that, uh, we won't send you a utilities payment. You know, you don't have to pay for your electricity, but that's all we can do. Well, let me tell you, that was enough. I, can you imagine? Uh, <laughs> they never thought we would have this many lights on at one time when they told us we wouldn't have to pay for utilities, much less to have such a hot day outside as it is today and be sitting in such a cool uh, environment because, uh, uh, but it was the same. We, we just didn't ever have to worry about that. So we were able to put everything we earned and um, collected and right back into the building. So what we had, we, uh, a group of volunteers that were very passionate, we had opening night photographs and uh, we had one little piece of the original carpeting left. And we also had, I, this is an important part of the story, a glass goldfish bowl <laughs> that we stuck up on our counter and any of our visitors who came in and we have so many route 66 visitors from all over the world not just from oklahoma or the surrounding states but i'm talking from all over the world come in here and if they liked what they were seeing or if they wanted to be they could drop some money in and i said you should have been able to come in and look at that glass bowl and know if we'd had very many visitors that day because talk about transparent accounting, but you know what? You couldn't tell because every time $11 accumulated in that goldfish bowl, one of our volunteers would grab it and run to the hardware store because at that time, a gallon of paint was costing us $11. So if you came in and you saw fresh paint on some wall somewhere, you knew we'd had $11 worth of donations and some, some uh, progress had been made. And really, our story is uh, incredible. It is miraculous. We talk about the miracles because <clears throat> we were so fortunate that the people did not just take down things and throw them away. They took them down, but they stored them. Now, not all of that was incredible. We, we threw out almost, documented almost six ton of trash. <laughs> it's a huge building. Um, but in there, we found incredible things like they had changed our marquee out front and it matched kind of the 60s and wrap around lit up thing and all that we found the moldings to the original marquee <laughs> that no one knew still were around and we were able to replicate that so now our marquee matches the original uh, we also found little uh, wax moldings that uh, were used to create the moldings for the walls and so those that had been taken down or destroyed we could 
replace those now. Um, we, uh, we, we're just working along with every little thing we could do. Um, we had a, a group of people who really wanted to find that organ that had been sold off. And for 10 years, they searched for that organ. We finally, uh, from Tulsa, there's a group of organ and, uh, down there, an organ society, and they gave us the name of a man who lived in Texas who, who had really developed a reputation for knowing a lot about these Wurlitzers and where they had maybe gone from their original homes, and, and they were able to connect us with his uh, contact information. So a woman from the city called the number one day and, and said to him, um, his name is Jim Peterson, and she said, uh, We've heard about you, and we were wondering if you might know anything about the organ that came from the Coleman Theater in, in our town, Miami, Oklahoma. She said there was a kind of a long pause, and uh, eventually Mr. Peterson said, um, well, I'm looking at it. He had purchased our organ himself, and he just had it in storage in Burleson, Texas. Didn't know what he was going to do with it. And she explained, oh, there's a group of volunteers working on that theater, and they're going to be so excited. And basically what he told her was, well, tell them good luck and goodbye. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> I guess he had the same idea of what a group of volunteers might be able to get done with a project like this. He didn't want to get tied up in it, and I, and I can see that. But uh, they didn't leave him alone. They just kept pestering him, and they finally went to Burleson and picked he and his wife up and brought them to Miami. And when he came in and saw what work was being done, how the volunteers had learned to do some, the gold leafing, and they started restoring gold leafing around the, the theater, and, and all of a sudden that uh, faded beauty was coming back to life, uh, you know, he said, the organ is the voice of the theater. And he says, I would love to see your theater get her voice back. So he offered us that for $100,000, he could make the console look brand new, and he would do all the work to bring back all the pipes and all the instruments and all that fill the organ chambers uh, full. Uh, he'd do all that work for $100,000, and we knew that was not an unfair price. But we also knew that our goldfish bowl hadn't been collecting that kind of money. And, uh, but, and so we, we explained that to him, but uh, we said, would you give us a chance to try to earn that money, to do some fundraising. He said, well, sure, I'm not in any hurry. I, I, yesterday, I would, didn't have the money. You know, it'll be fine. I, I'll be the same tomorrow. So uh, it was fine, but after about three years, when we hadn't really been making much progress, we were basically paying his rent on the storage unit, uh, he let us know he had been offered $300,000 for the organ. And he hated, he said, now I'm not trying to get out of it, but I don't want to miss out on this either. Do we think this will ever happen or, or should I just go on and you go on and not, you know, let's not part angry, but that. And uh, we said, well, we hoped it would work and we would, if you'd give us another chance, we could try one more time. Well, we went out throughout the whole county. I think we shook every bush and we rang every doorbell. We raised $100,000 and we were able to get the largest U-Haul truck and go to Burleson and load that thing full. We brought it all back and people showed up, through, the whole community came in and, and helped to unload it and there were pipes that were like this tall and pipes that are 18 foot tall. Spread that all across the stage. He came in to work and he needed volunteers and he had a group of about 30 people who uh, would work with him every day, night and day. It took about six months time but today we have the only Wurlitzer pipe organ, movie, uh, movie theater organ, that was built in 1928 that is in the venue that it was built for in the world. And so that's incredible. You know, there's about 20 from all ages, and, and we're one of them, but we're the only one from 1928. So a couple of times a year, we'll bring in a world-famous organist. We show a silent movie for the weekend, and, and you get to sit here and just realize that's what that organ was built to do for this place, and you see those films, and it's just a great experience. But the work goes on and on and, and on. Uh, I could just, I could tell you the chandelier that was uh, taken down. Uh, after we'd been working for a bit, the people who eventually bought the home, the Coleman home, called one day, and she said, out in, this, out in the stable, there's a big rusty piece of metal under a bunch of hay. She said, uh, it looks like a furnishing, but it's way too big for the house. Could it be something from the theater? Well, it was the framework of the chandelier. We were so excited. We had found all the candelabras that go on it in boxes around here, but then we had the big, big problem of the frosted glass. 
The frosted glass um, was all broken out. It had been handmade in Italy a hundred years before. We had no idea where to get, and without those molds, it was gonna be a costly thing to try to do. So we looked all over for the molds. Then we started looking for glass blowers who might do it and what it would cost. We weren't having any luck. We knew we weren't gonna be able to afford it. And one day a group of people came in from Columbia, Missouri. They have a theater built in Columbia that was built by the same people who built ours. In fact, they ended up building about 139 theaters in the Midwest. And uh, so they were just out touring around seeing Bowler Brother theaters. And uh, they had seen several on the way over, described them to us. Each one was unique, nothing really similar about them. But they got inside of our theater and said, your theater is the big sister to our theater. They were amazed and they spent their whole time here comparing their two theaters. As they were leaving, one of the men stopped at our, on a bulletin board in our lobby and just mentioned to his friend, hey, looky there, they even had a chandelier like ours. Well, that perked up our ears and we said, well, hey, speaking of chandeliers, that is, that's, that is yours like that? And they said, exactly. And we said, wow, would you ever have to have replaced any of your glass? Would you know who might uh, have the molds so that we could contact them? And they go, yeah, we know who have the, has the molds. We do. When they finished our theater, they left the molds with us. So they had the molds right there in Columbia. And a lady from Columbia does glass work. And she says, I'll do that for you just at the cost of the material. You pay for the material. I won't charge you any labor. Still gonna be about $20,000, but we said do it without even thinking, without even wondering where that $20,000 was gonna come from. So uh, it was great for six months. <laughs> and then she called us on a Wednesday afternoon and said, they're done. Oh yeah, there's a little $20,000 price tag. What are we gonna do? We told her how excited we were and we said, let us decide how we're gonna transport it. That was Wednesday afternoon. Friday morning in the mail, a day and a half later, we received the notification of a grant that we had been awarded for $20,000. And that's how we paid for it. Those are the miracles. Those are the things that, that are just unreal. Uh, I, I didn't mention, but I, I think back behind me, you might be able to see the backdrop that's on the stage. That backdrop we found hanging up in the, in the rigging uh, that, you know, we had 29 battens and we were just putting in new rope and we pulled them down and we recognize this as the backdrop that's in the opening night photographs. And then, so that's our renovation. And there's lots of stories I could tell, a million, million of those, but I wanna say also beyond that, in the 330 days that they rushed to get the theater open, they framed up a building, but they left 5,000 square foot of space that was to be a grand ballroom. Well, they didn't finish that out. Um, it collected a lot of the things that we had to throw out. But uh, the one thing that did happen that's kind of unique, uh, I think, or at least of interest to Oklahoma residents is um, we have a an local artist who was commissioned by the state to paint murals for the state capitol in the rotunda. And uh, so they're big 15 foot tall, really wide murals. His studio was across the street from us on the second floor above his parents' paint store. And he didn't have the room for that but he remembered all that ballroom space and all the windows along the side of the building. And so that's where those murals from the rotunda at the state capitol were painted. And the people that are in them, the subjects of the settling of Oklahoma, were all of our local folks who just came up and posed and, and had their pictures painted there. But about 11 years ago, we decided, let's see what we can do. And we finished out that ballroom. So now we do have a beautiful ballroom space uh, to go along with our theater. And, and it just makes for some great events and, and uh, all sorts of activities. So then was there a grand reopening? So I'm going to say that the closest thing that we would have had to a grand reopening would have probably been the 75th birthday celebration. We uh, had we planned a big vaudeville kind of show and we invited all of the town and we were serving birthday cake. And uh, so it was wonderful. And it was a time for a lot of people to see the Coleman as they had never seen it. And a lot of people to see it as they had remembered because we had sneaked in the chandelier on them. And so they didn't know it was coming back. And we got everybody in here and we asked people to, to get out, uh, uh, go close to the front because from underneath the uh, loge area, you can't see looking up. Uh, so anyway, and it, uh, as it started, we lit that chandelier and people clapped and they cried and uh, it, was, it was neat. 
That was a great step back in time. So what do you offer your guests today? Uh, we have a, today, what we do with uh, the Coleman Theater is kind of multifaceted. Uh, you know, we had so many people work on restoring this theater and, and they were a little divided amongst uh, their, their mission statement, I should say, uh, because some people thought, we've done all this work, we have all of these things back in order and they look beautiful, we need to keep them looking beautiful. This needs to just be a museum, we'll be open for tours, people can come and see what things used to be like. We all kind of like that, but there's the other half of us who are theater people and who love that the theater was here and we have that rich history of those famous performers who've been on our stage and why would we have that space in our community and not be using it. So um, that division kind of started, it got married eventually. And I kind of think the best way to look at us today is if you've ever watched those Ben Stiller Night at the Museum movies, that's what the Coleman Theater is like today. You come by in the day and we're gonna show you a step back into 1929 and then we'll tell you all about our restoration and, and but we, we'll let you just revisit the past. But when you come back at night, everything in here comes to life and it is a, an exciting, thriving, it's still a little step and nod to the past, but, but uh, we work with uh, all sorts of performers. We have all sorts of acts that come in and, uh, and uh, just a little bit of everything for a live performance. So then does the theater still offer a wide variety of different kinds of performances? So for an example of the different types of uh, performances that we do, we, we uh, are so close to the Branson, Missouri area that we have a lot of those acts that people so enjoy vacationing and getting to go over and see you know, when it's not vacation season, they're still wanting to perform. And so they'll call us and they want to come by and put on their show. So we, we have uh, those kinds of shows a lot. We've had uh, some of their, uh, no, many of their most famous acts. Soji Tabushi was here and uh, the group six has been here several times. Uh, the platters come over uh, regularly. They're, they're about uh, every year. So, uh, so we, we bring in that. We, do some movies, but we try not to do movies that are um, currently out showing in the in the other theaters. So typically it'll be some nod to uh, the past. We have one traditional movie that we show every holiday season, and that's the movie It's a Wonderful Life. And uh, if we tried not to show that, we would be in trouble. In fact, right now, I yesterday had two emails from people saying, those tickets aren't on for sale, or we are doing It's a Wonderful Life, because their families have come for so many years in a row, they don't want to see that tradition broken. So we do those, but we're, we're really excited. Next Sunday, we're gonna show the movie, A League of Their Own. And uh, so with that, uh, we're not just showing the movie, but we have a woman who lives in the area who actually played in that women's professional baseball league. And she's gonna come in beforehand. We're gonna sit down and just have a little conversation. She's gonna tell us what it was like to have been involved with that. So that's the kind of thing we like to do. Next April, we're gonna show a Desi and Lucy the long trailer, which always reminds me a, a little bit of uh, Route 66. So we're gonna show that movie, Lucy's personal secretary lives in Grove. She's coming in. She's going to do the same type of thing. She's bringing with her the former director of the Lucy Museum from Jamestown. He's bringing all sorts of memorabilia. We're going to build that one up as, as high as we can. We're going to try to include a lot more events for that. So uh, those are the kinds of movie. Uh, they're, they're more events they're, instead of just showing movies, but we do that. Uh, we are also the Miami schools. Uh, their, their students do all of their programs here, their Christmas programs, their spring programs are here. Uh, we're gonna have a very special event this year on 9-11. There is a gentleman who uh, uh, is a military uh, man who was in his office in the Pentagon on 9-11. He's gonna be here to share with us that, that is story, that event is free to the public. Uh, we're really excited uh, about that. We try to uh, bring in uh, other programming that we, people, one of the, <laughs> through the years, we brought in the Bob Wills Texas Playboys, and that is always a crowd pleaser. They'll be here in September this year. We uh, have a brand new musical that was actually written about the uh, pitcher area that Mr. Coleman uh, started the mining over there. So they're going to bring uh, that uh, play in here uh, from the East Coast. It'll be here in uh, October. Um, 
We have the Isaacs, we have Mark Lowry. So um, a Kenny Rogers Band is gonna be here. Those are taking us through uh, our holiday times. Uh, we, we just try to find something that we're gonna find an audience uh, is looking for and, and be able to come and see that right here in their hometown. And uh, what spurred us on through that and, and to reach out to some of these names of, that are a little more recognized on a national level is we landed uh, Winona Judd here about a year and a half ago. And uh, when we saw people's response to that. We said, people are wanting to come and, and uh, we, th we think these things could work and, and they have. They've just been expanding. What about the silent movies? Do you still play them? Uh, yes, uh, we do still show m silent movies here at least twice a year. We bring in our, uh, our own uh, house organist, Dennis James, who travels the globe playing uh, for silent movies. And uh, he will be here again in this October. He'll be here again in April. And uh, don't miss out. It, they're, uh, they are absolutely uh, incredible experience. Now, tell us about the Friends of the Coleman. Okay, so much of this work uh, that has been done in renovating our theater uh, has, like I said, it's just been done by volunteers who've come in. They, they kind of uh, got their ranks together. They formed an organization known as the Friends of the Coleman, and they support every, uh, the activities around the Coleman. They help us with projects all the time. Uh, they do things like, um, well, they recently, about two years ago, put in some mini split units in our dressing rooms that have made the world of difference for the performers. For the first time, air conditioning <laughs> since 1929 that hadn't been. You know, they're, they're good to help us do anything. And But they have such a heart for this place. And um, so uh, probably now about 10 or 12 years ago, they discovered that in looking around up in the balcony, there were a couple of places that had um, uh, missing light fixtures. Well, in one of the places there was a light fixture there, but it definitely didn't fit any of the style or the decor. And it looked like an outside carriage house light. And, and you knew it wasn't right. Well, we did enough research and, and tried to find photographs and we realized there had been a big beautiful sconce uh, four different places up in the balcony that were just missing. And uh, we went back to that theater over in Columbia and they had theirs. We drew out the measurements, we drew out everything that it took to, and we had those created, or the friends of the Coleman did. They ran into a problem because they are so top heavy that uh, fitting them into the place in the wall where they went, our electrician said they're just going to get knocked over and you're going to break all that crystal that's on top. It's just, it's not going to be worth the time or the effort to put those up. And so they were at such a conundrum. It had been, like I said, it's been 10 or 11 years and they had them ready. They just couldn't get them hung but they wouldn't just stop and take no for an, an answer. And uh, one of our uh, uh, members, well, she was the president at the time, she looked around, she asked everywhere she could think of, and finally discovered a man who had been an instructor uh, at uh, our local community college, and he did uh, the type of work that she thought might connect to this. He came in and looked it over, and he discovered he, he was gonna have to make a part, but he could make a part that would bring the, that make those uh, steady and so uh, he did that and for the first time and we don't even know when they disappeared but uh, in any time that we can remember we got these beautiful sconces back up and we're so proud of and uh, they just uh, and no pun here they're just a reflection of the work of the friends of the Coleman who are tireless at helping uh, us up and going and they, they work so hard with uh, they, they want Route 66 people to be so welcome here, the travelers. The, they, I think they would like it if we were uh, open a few more hours every day and evening <laughs> and every day of the week because we, we, they drive by and they'll see maybe uh, on a Sunday afternoon, somebody who is uh, looking in the theater window and, and wishing they could come in and they, they yell out at them, what are you doing Route 66? Uh, yeah, well, just a minute, let me call somebody. If you need to get in there, I'll, I'll get someone to come and open up for you. You know, uh, they, they're so proud of the of the facility and the uh, ability to show that to uh, the, our travelers. And so uh, it's just uh, it really reflects in everything that they do. Thank you, Danny, for a great interview. If you would like more information about the Coleman Theater, you can visit their website at thecolemantheater.org. And you can also see them on Facebook at facebook.com backslash the Coleman Theater. Thank you for watching this video. 
You know, I just love Route 66 and the era of Americana that Route 66 represents. Producing these videos is my way of giving back to Route 66 and to promote Route 66 to people, not just in the United States, but to people all around the world. Now, if you enjoy watching these videos, please let me know by clicking the subscribe button. And if you wanna be notified when new videos are posted, then just simply ring the bell.